Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another Afghan Eye Live. My name is Sangar Paikar. And I am Ahmed Walid Kakar. Guys, in the chat, welcome everyone. Uh, can you all just let us know if the audio is working fine? Can you hear me? Am I audible? Is there any noise? Is there any static? Anything of that nature? Let me know because we are currently using a new setup. No new equipment, but I did some tweaks here and there to get rid of all the static and all the noise that we were experiencing recently. Uh, hopefully everything is audible. I don't see any response. So uh, let us assume that everything is fine. Uh, Walid, I'm sure you can also hear me. I yes, I can. Uh, I'm just busy doing my usual task of sending around the link to, to everyone. Yes. So just uh, bear with me. And uh, Paul, I'm just going to take this opportunity to apologize, everyone. This wasn't something that was planned massively in advance. Hence, we're here rather randomly. Uh, but just bear with us because today's topic is a very important one on which we will be discussing uh, quite a few things and really, you know, delving into the, uh, you know, the intricacies of some of these things about which we will be reading. So just bear with us guys. And uh, yeah, that is, that is basically that. Yeah, so uh, yeah. <clears throat> we are live, the links are shared with everyone. Uh, people in the chat. I hope you're all doing well. Welcome again. Uh, so glad to have you all with us. It's always a pleasure when we are doing these live shows that there are a couple of people who are there immediately. Vlad, Vlad, Nazdarovye, Dobry Din. I think he's Romanian, Sangar. He's not. He's Romanian. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Perleste, Rumeneste. Okay. Uh, Vlad, okay. good to see you. Uh, so um so there are there are 20 or something people watching right now and we've only got eight likes on the video so you i'm not even going to tell you guys to like the video i think you should probably know by now what i'm going to say so uh <laughs> you you know what to do about that uh and uh yeah so essentially guys today our live stream is about well it's been a pretty busy week since our last live stream uh, two momentous articles have been written about the fall of Kabul or the liberation of Kabul because we're inclusive. We have to use terminology that everyone uh, can relate to. But two, uh, two articles have been written on the events leading up to the 15th of August. And Sangad, myself, and Dr. Talha also found ourselves memed on Twitter. Uh, so it's been... <laughs> a busy it's been a busy eventful week but in any case i'm not gonna you know i don't think we're gonna discuss the meme that was uh, that was made about us uh, funny and creative as it was we're actually going to be focused on one of the articles that have been written and that article is authored by none other than uh, steve cole together with adam entaus now steve cole if you don't know him is the author of ghost wars which is a book I have read and is also the author of Directorate S, which, uh, which I have read uh, twice, I believe. So uh, Ibrahim K is saying the troll did his research on the meme, though. You had the long hair, Ahmed. Yeah, it was, uh, it was impressive. The guy really did pay attention to detail. Uh, but uh, with regarding to Steve Cole, uh, he's also the dean of Columbia School of Journalism. Columbia University, he, he won two Pulitzer Prizes, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, 
so for the people who just know steve cole from his uh, uh ghost wars book and director at s i mean this guy is massive like he he is probably one of the most authoritative uh, figures as as a journalist researcher on afghanistan obviously we uh we don't agree with everything that he says and uh, what he writes, but we do have to acknowledge that uh, uh, it's quite something when someone like Steve Cole publishes anything about Afghanistan. Basically, so without further ado, Sanger, this article is basically covering the. Let's pull out the title of the article: "The Secret History of the U.S. Diplomatic Failure." in Afghanistan. Now, this article covers many, uh, many things, uh, especially the American negotiations with the Taliban, as well as uh, intra-Afghan negotiations. Now, you yourself, Sankar, knowing that alongside me, you were very much a proponent of intra-Afghan negotiations and the negotiations with the Taliban and a peaceful resolution of the conflict. How did this article make you feel? Well, uh, to be honest, you know, uh, I uh, sort of always expect that whenever Steve Cole publishes something, that there will be some sort of vindication on my side. Like, I feel like, aha, you see, very, very humble. Yes. He said that I, I was I was saying this and now Steve Cole said this, too. You know, because there are a lot of things that we hear and we know and we think and suspect, okay? But we do not have the same kind of access that Steve Cole has, especially in the United States with all these army and gen generals and politicians and uh, members of Congress. We don't have that. Uh, what we do have is our own eyes and ears and our own network within the Afghan community in Afghanistan, etc. So we have alternative ways of hearing things. But once we see an article published or a book published by someone as authoritative as Steve Cole, it sort of affirms a lot of things that we know in advance. And there are also quite a lot of revelations, which is also I think uh, one of the reasons why everyone is sort of in a state of, oh, have you read the Steve Cole article? Like a any Afghanistan nerd is right now, have you read the Steve Cole article? And two of the biggest nerds are here uh, present in front of you guys <laughs> discussing the article. And, and I, 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 I think, you know, that uh, there is a lot to discuss here. Uh, there are a lot of very uh, funny, amusing quotes that we are going to uh, uh, talk about. Insightful as well. Insightful, insightful definitely, well. definitely so, insightful. So to break, so to break this down to uh, everyone. So this article, I don't have the precise word count of it, but I would say it probably goes to about about definitely above 10,000, probably in between the 15 to 20,000 range. So obviously, uh, for everyone that's here, of, you know, the regular sort of uh, listeners or watchers of our live stream will know that we kind of have a plan for a live stream, get distracted by the live chat. And then before you know it, it sort of goes over two hours. Uh, and obviously you guys can imagine with the amount of sort of revelations that have been made in this article, especially when it comes to sort of private behind the door uh, conversations that I had, it's going to be very uh, difficult that um, it's going to be very difficult in that sense to be able to give a full and comprehensive breakdown analysis and commentary of the article. But rather what we have done is um, we've selected a couple of the main key points sort of a thematic dissection of the article at a surface level almost in chronological order and like i said some of the things that are very uh insightful some of the things that vindicated us maybe some things did not vindicate us or contradicted us 
I didn't see anything of the sort. <laughs> Not very humble of me. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I can see in the live chat we have two of our moderators here today. Uh, so there's Wardak Media, Khutaydirawala Wardak Media, and there's KJ Khan as well, who has been missing for quite a while uh, and who's with us today. So uh, any uh, the only guidelines I have for the two of you is any comment that's made in the live chat that uh encourages racial ethnic whatever bigotry please remove any indian trolls like we had in the uh august period <laughs> you know you guys already know how the drill is so i'm gonna go into the article now itself right so um someone just said i love watching you keep a straight face whilst they know i'm i, I feel like laughing but yeah the, in any case let so let's go ahead i'm gonna shut off shut off my whatsapp and i'm gonna avoid the live chat for the time being as well so what we have is the article the secret history of the u.s diplomatic failure in afghanistan like i said by steve cole and adam entaus now the title is very obvious the history behind the doors of how the US and the diplomatic sphere failed in Afghanistan. So what the article does is in the introductory section, it actually, to set the tone, right, it compares with Vietnam. So if I pull out, so it brings out Vietnam, and then it concludes and it says that probably not the best, uh, Damn that. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm on the wrong part of the uh... two years late. The Islamic Republic's last chapter followed a strikingly similar course. For years, peace talks were stalled by the Taliban's refusal to speak with the Afghan government. But in 2018, President Donald Trump determined to end the war with or without the Afghan president's involvement, appointed the special envoy Zalmay Khalilzad to negotiate directly with the Taliban, which had representatives in Doha. And Steve Cole obviously gives somewhat of a breakdown as to how that happens. Uh, and he speaks about the fact that the first attempts to make contact with the Taliban for a negotiated end to the conflict uh, took place in 2010. So it's kind of heartbreaking in that sense, Sanger. Since 2010, how many lives have been lost, right? I would, I would uh, say this... in, in the hundreds of thousands, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and we're only talking about those that have been counted by uh, international organizations. How many uh, ha of them have not been counted at all? Exactly. But it, so so is, just uh, one second. Do you want me to show mm -hmm. the text that you're uh, reading? Yes, please. OK, here we go. All right. So background, the quotes that you uh, have. Uh, uh, throughout the where f f so we start from by the way guys by by the way guys this is not the article verbatim this is the these are the main quotes that we've sort of pulled together yes. from the article thank you by the way Sanger. you've made my life a lot easier with this so um essentially this is the background to the article this is what lays sort of the uh the tone of the article so it starts off with the comparison to vietnam and it also covers the 23rd of July visit of the Afghan government or the then Afghan government uh, to Washington DC in which Amrullah Saleh, the first vice president, said that he had felt backstabbed by Biden's decision to withdraw and he reluctantly agreed to stick to a rosy narrative. That rosy narrative was the one that was put forth by President Ghani, who insisted that a front of resilient unity is displayed to the American President Biden in order to solicit more of his support. Now, there's also uh, a couple of things that are worthy of mentioning here. Throughout the negotiations, Ghani maintained back channels to American politicians who were supportive of the war, or we could say neocons or democratic neocons as well. And what's really interesting here is that the American Secretary of State in response to this, Mike Pompeo said that Ghani is actually mobilizing Washington against the Trump administration. The view of many State Department in officials, including nonpartisan career diplomats, was that Ghani had little interest in negotiating with the Taliban. Quote, he preferred the status quo, uh, as Khalilzad said. It kept him in power. Well, Sanger, that's point number one 
in which you and I have been vindicated when we were supportive of the intra-Afghan negotiations yes. and catching a lot of heat for it. Uh, it was also because we were saying that the president himself was not too keen on the peace negotiations. But if we go to the next paragraph as well, we see the Taliban refused to work with the Afghan president. And that was something that went back to the time of Hamid Karzai. Uh, and that was because they saw him as an illegitimate puppet. Karzai, in turn, objected to America conferring legitimacy on extremist rebels bent on overthrowing his government. You betrayed me. Karzai shouted at Ryan Crocker, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan. So clearly what we're seeing here is that there's a consistency in the stance of the Taliban. I was actually listening to an interview the other day, Sanger, of um, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, who was basically saying that if the Taliban were to legitimize the regime in Kabul, they would delegitimize themselves. Because if you grant legitimacy to someone and you're fighting against it, what does that say about you, right? But for the purpose of this conversation, we're going to look more at Reni. So Steve Cole's actually given quite a good profile of Reni. Uh, so Kadebeli Safet of Larsu Sangar. Yes. So this is the background to um, President Reni that's provided by Steve Cole. And once again, I personally really strongly believe, despite my dislike or my antipathy towards certain individuals, everyone and everything needs to be contextualized. So Reni sought to empower those whom he referred to as Afghanistan stakeholders. So human rights activists, those guys that <laughs> those guys that on Twitter anyway are the least pro-human rights, Islamic scholars, media companies, and business. Uh, he populated his wartime administration with other technocrats. Ah, God, God save us from those technocrats who had graduate degrees from universities abroad and spurned traditional Afghan politicians and strongmen who he thought had brought the country to ruin. And that is why Ashraf Rani held, and even until his last days, continued to hold some level of appeal. Uh, a lot of Afghans, myself at one point included, liked the fact that Ashraf Rani was not doing politics the traditional way. The traditional way, obviously, in the uh, post-2001 context in which warlords would milk the country for everything it's got. Now, here's actually a quote of the American ambassador to Kabul during Rani's first term, that he's not a good politician. There are loads of things that admire about him, but he wasn't able to find political skills necessary to build coalitions and partnerships with people who disagreed with him. And there's also, of course, and that is, I guess we could say, uh, Sanger, I don't know if you'd agree with me, to Rani's credit, uh, maybe not in the political sense, but in the in the moral sense, right, that he was unwilling to compromise his ideals. But we'll defer judgment. But there's also sort of this quote I picked up because it gives quite a good encapsulation of the kind of temperament that President Rani had. So essentially the context there is that Zalmay Khalilzad met Ashraf Rani in the uh, run-up to during the uh, intra-Afghan negotiations and then went to Pakistan where he met with the Taliban. And the article says, when Rani heard about the meeting, after it was over, he exploded. He was known for having a temper. Quote, he would become emotional and start shouting Yasin Zia, a four-star Afghan general who was appointed chief of army staff in 2020, said. So... And I, Yasin Ziyar later on goes on in the article to say that this kind of behavior is not really, not just befitting, but it's not really um, going to help you in the context uh, of war itself. And so, Kadir Bili Safet of Lars Yeah, just, just uh, something very briefly. You see, uh, from uh, people uh, who have met uh, Ghani even before he became president, uh, during his tenure as a uh, dean of Kabul University, when he was a minister, and later he had all sorts of different jobs. We have consistently always heard that he loses his temper and he starts shouting profanity at people. Okay, so uh, this is like the face of Rani we know from people who have interacted with him. And at the same time, his personality in, in the public sphere, 
as an intellectual, a guy who was a professor and uh, world's second greatest thinker. You see, uh, a lot of uh, intellectuals have a bad temper, okay? But we're talking about men who have leadership qualities. And, le and, and like losing your temper in public and shouting and using profanity, that's not leadership, okay? And, and you will also find that now this article is revealing certain things that a lot of us Afghans, we knew it. And when we were very critical and very uh, distrustful of Ghani, or uh, his uh, politics and everything. It wasn't just because we uh, we had any issues with him or whatever. We just believe that he is simply not fit as a leader. He doesn't have the characteristics of a good leader. And w this quote from uh, Yasin Zia, uh, you see, it, 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 uh, as I said in the beginning, it vindicates what we have been saying all along so the next page yeah sure so if we go to the next page <clears throat> we are looking at um uh someone is asking if ashraf Ghani was the world's second greatest thinker who was the first that's actually a question i've never asked before who was this hunger at least according to the Ghani baba crowd uh those are the questions that you are not supposed to ask <laughs> okay understood so those are the questions we don't ask those questions <laughs> So, uh, now given that we've given somewhat of a breakdown between uh, of uh, Ashraf Ghani's temperament, uh, the fact that many people in the State Department uh, saw that he or perceived that he was not in favor of peace talks, now we're getting on to the peace talks themselves. So, the United States and the Taliban opened formal negotiations on January the 22nd, 2019. Predictably, Zalmay Khalilzad led the American delegation. Now, Khalilzad plays a big part in this article. In fact, Khalilzad plays a big part in the history of Afghanistan <laughs> and Iraq uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, so Zalmay Khalilzad was essentially the one, the primary American diplomat who shaped the course that the Afghan state took after 2001. He was a staunch ally of uh, President Hamid Karzai. Um, he helped Hamid Karzai in some of his internal beefs with other warlords. Uh, more Republican leading, he is an Afghan uh, by descent, uh, naturalized American citizen of Pashtun ancestry, uh, which has led to quite a few conspiracy theories, as you will. But in any case, uh, Trump appoints Khalilzad as his special envoy for Afghan peace. And in this article as well, it's not it's not mentioned in the quotes that we've listed here. But in the article itself, it said that Trump said, I heard he's a con man with regard to Khalilzad. But then it's also said that for jobs like this, like brokering peace, you need con men. So uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, the guy who was one of the most formative characters in forming the Afghan state post-2001, unwittingly becomes one of its chief undertakers and buries the Afghan state between 2018 and 2021. And I say unwittingly, because as we'll see through the course of this article, Khalilzad was not plotting uh, Pashtun supremacy by ditching Ghani and bringing the Taliban in, but events were somewhat out of or, his control. Or what uh, uh, Hamdullah Moheb said is that uh, Khalilzad is doing that because he wants to become the leader of Afghanistan. The Viceroy. The Viceroy. Viceroy. So, and on the other hand, you have, who's leading the Taliban delegation, is Sher Mohammad Abbas Tanakzai, who is currently the Deputy Foreign Minister of Afghanistan. He was the Deputy Foreign Minister of Afghanistan uh, under the previous Taliban emirate as well. And I believe was in Sayaf's party during the 1980s and has been in the Taliban since the mid 90s. So uh, there's an opening statement that's delivered as negotiations begin on Jan January 22nd, 2019. And Stan Exe says in his opening statement, war has gone on for too long. We have shed millions of gallons of blood, 
We want peace in Afghanistan through negotiations. Abdullah Amini, a veteran advisor to U.S. military commanders in Kabul who'd lost many relatives during the long conflict, audibly wept as he translated Stanek Zay's remarks for the American delegation. And that, I think, is really telling the fact that whilst we sort of, um, we, you know, with, with regard to the political differences aside, at the end of the day, Afghans on all sides have lost massive amounts, uh, not just in terms of wealth, but in terms of families as well. Uh, so that is the context in which these intra-Afghan negotiations would uh, begin. And at the same time, one of the priorities of the Americans is that a just, uh, a durable ceasefire needs to be established in Afghanistan so that the benefits of negotiating with the Taliban can become apparent in Washington. One of the pitfalls of American foreign policy is the is how dependent it is on domestic squabbling within Washington, D.C. So it says here that American commanders believed it would be dangerous and dishonorable to leave the war to leave the war without political settlement amongst the Afghans and the durable ceasefire. But Khalidzad was worried that a hardline approach would stall the talks and encourage Trump to abandon the Islamic Republic even more abruptly. He suggests that they return to disputes later. So this is essentially uh, putting into context the job that Khalilzad has. Uh, he obviously quite clearly doesn't trust the temperament of Donald Trump, who is very clearly in favor of withdrawal. <clears throat> Trump was initially talked into escalating the Afghan war, amongst others, by his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster. Um, and I think in the article it says as well, I should have listened to my instincts instead of my generals. So Trump is extremely desperate to leave Afghanistan. And with that in mind, Khalilzad is on the one hand trying not to give the Taliban too much. On the other hand, is trying not to drive too hard a bargain because he's scared that Trump will undercut him anyways. Uh, and now one of the features of these intra-Afghan negotiations um, is the release of Mullah Bradera Khund, who's a co-founder of the Taliban, currently the deputy prime minister of Afghanistan. He was the deputy defense minister of Afghanistan during the first Taliban emirate, uh, the deputy to the emir himself in terms of the Taliban's organization. And he was detained in Pakistan by Pakistani officials uh, and held in detention for about eight to nine years. Um, and that was allegedly due to the fact that um, that Brader was trying to negotiate peace with Karzai, the president of the time, independently of the Pakistani ISI. Uh, now, to what extent that's true, still yet to be established. Uh, it's not really something on which there is much consensus. But because of Khalidzad's efforts in brokering peace, he actually applied pressure on the Pakistani government or more accurately, on the chief of the army staff, General Bajwa, to release Brader. And so this is a really interesting uh, retelling of the first meeting between Khalilzad and Brader. I've studied you, Khalilzad told Brader, according to Lisa Curtis, an Afghanistan specialist on Trump's national security staff who was president at the meeting. I know you're a man of peace. And Brader replied, I realize I would not be sitting at this table if it were not for you. Now, this is one thing I found interesting, Sangad, and I wanted to ask you about it to get your thoughts. Bradar did not attend regularly, but Khalilzad occasionally visited him in his hotel room. Now, why was Bradar not attending regularly, in your opinion? Well, uh, there are uh, two uh, explanations. Uh, one is that uh, the most part of the negotiation was done by Sheikh Mohammad Abbas Tanekzai and uh, Amir Khan Muttaqi and uh, other negotiators who uh, are fluent in multiple languages, etc. And uh, not everyone who was part of the negotiating team was actually involved in all the haggling and everything. The other uh, theory is that uh, uh, Mullah Bradar 
was released from prison very recently and even until today for a man for his age he has suffered quite a lot 10 almost 10 years in prison in pakistan god knows what they have done uh, to him uh, like like he, he is very quiet and he's not very uh, vocal and I, I suspect that that may be that he is still recovering. Like uh, we know a few other people who have spent quite a lot of time in prison in Polacharchi, in Bagram and other places. And when you talk to such people, you know that it's, it's not like going to prison here in the Netherlands where you have PlayStation and uh, whatnot. Uh, people have actually suffered. So I think maybe he has the leadership and the authority um, over the movement and he was uh, sent to Doha in that capacity but uh, he wasn't really capable of going every day from uh, 8 to 5 uh, talking and negotiating with these American delegates. Maybe that's I, 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 I'm more inclined to believe that. OK, sure. So there's one question here. Uh, Yunusay Jazi is saying, I'm not a Ghani fan, but isn't it dishonest not to attribute him any credit for building an economic system from scratch? Uh, I would say, yeah, it is. Uh, I do give him credit for building the economic system from scratch. Uh, I think it's well known that as finance minister, he was pretty successful. Uh, obviously, he was only a finance minister for three years, which meant that the work that he did uh, was not sort of the largest component of factors that led to the Afghan economy becoming what it became. So, yeah, I give I, I do give him credit for that. Um, it's just that during his time as president but once again this can go back to the fact that um that you know to what extent was he able to reform the economy as president because the war was escalating but yeah i, I give him credit for that and he also says quite frankly most of what we have in frozen reserves are savings from his time as a finance minister um i i, I take your point i i don't disagree um but here's another thing tanger in this article Mark Pompeo allegedly says that Bradar is a very sophisticated player. Okay. And I've heard from people that were in the intra Afghan negotiations or at some meetings between Khalil Zad and Bradar, right? Uh, that he was very quiet. Okay. He was very quiet, didn't say much. And in fact, he'd just be sat and doing his tasbih okay and just listening and not saying much now with that play that picture over in your mind let's say Khalid Zad is sat next to Bradar and we know Khalid Zad is a proper American he's very flamboyant jokey charismatic whatever sort of character and he's speaking to Bradar who is very quiet and just nodding along silently agreeing and just doing his tasbih now, once you've placed that picture in your brain, right, let's come back to the question. Uh, brother, Mullah Bradar was not attending these talks. Does the picture that I just gave you affect the explanation you may or may not have? Most definitely. Definitely. Yes, uh, I, I agree. And that would also make sense that, uh, that maybe he was more of the strategist who would observe and uh, then give his guidance to Sher Mohammed Abbas Tanekzai and others, and they would uh, do what he uh, what he's what he has told them. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And you know the whole character that you just described. It's the the, the very typical uh, rural Afghans, the older generation. You have these old men who are always quiet but they're aware of everything <laughs> they know everything yeah. you know this is a this is a, so this is this is the thing is that i had sort of a general perception of his temperament based on that one thing and once again this is from someone who was at the doha talks and was just like this 
it was a Westerner, okay? And he was like, he is, he is an immense politician. And I was like, oh, how? Like, he just wouldn't say anything. He just let Khalil Zad do all the talking, right? And if you think of it in a negotiation, the less you say, uh, you obviously sort of come across more authoritative, but there's also less room to make mistakes, right? And the more you say, the more room there is to make mistakes. So that is potentially one of the reasons for which Pompeo said that Mullah Bradar is, I quote, a very sophisticated player. Uh, maybe he had something else in mind. We may find out another time. So in any case, Kaole Su... Okay, so um, this is... We're talking about... Um, no, 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 Porta Warza, Porta Warza, Mana Galati Waswa. Uh, about the two secret annexes? Yes. The Americans still hadn't determined whether the Taliban would exactly, accept. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So if we look, so this is, we're talking about 2020. So for those that aren't aware, uh, the Afghan peace process was meant to yield an American Taliban agreement. But then a suicide attack happened in Kabul and Trump cancelled it and it was delayed by a few months. So where Vlad Vlad is asking, Ghalati means mistake like in Arabic. Yes, it does. Um, so the Americans still hadn't determined whether the Taliban would accept. So this passage that I'm reading, just to clarify, is before Trump cancelled or postponed the signing of the peace deal, right? The Americans still hadn't determined whether the Taliban would accept a ceasefire in its war against the Afghan Islamic Republic. In early July, Molly Fi Khalil Zad's deputy pressed on Xay on the topic, which she described as an issue of, quote, extreme importance, unquote, to the, quote, most senior American leadership, unquote. So once again, like I mentioned before, priority was given to getting the Taliban to agree to a ceasefire. Why would that matter? Well, violence was the Taliban's leverage. And the fact that the Americans were now losing this war meant that any ceasing of the violence, even if it was temporary, would benefit them as well as, you know, prove to some of the critics of the peace process that the Taliban were actually reasonable enough to negotiate with. But Steve Cole goes on and says Stanek Zay would not budge. He actually introduced a new demand. He wanted thousands of Taliban prisoners held by Ghani's government released. The Taliban envoys insisted they needed the concession to convince their most hardline factions of the benefits of peace talks. What do you make of that? Sandra? So let's say, let's say there are two sides. One is pressing the other. They basically more or less agreed on a general framework, right? Yes. Uh, they, they both know what the other one and one is pressing the other okay at least stop violence for a bit and not only does he say no but he's like actually you're also going to release five thousand of our prisoners uh you see what do you make of that this 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 reveals that the taliban had the upper hand okay and mm -hmm. why why did they have the upper hand and this is also stuff that we discussed in previous uh, podcasts and live streams and etc and this is also why we were in favor of uh, the intra-Afghan negotiations is because the Americans, they did not have the will or the stamina or the motivation to continue with this war. Okay. And the, the Taliban were very well aware of that. They were aware that the Americans want to get out. They are just looking for a convenient way to organize their departure. And that's why the Taliban, uh, when they sat across the table with the Americans, they knew these guys, they really want to go. They're just looking for a well-organized way to announce it and leave. So obviously they made demands. So, so what what do you make of Stanek Zay not just refusing the American demand, but also issuing further demands? It's a uh, bit bully. Uh, it sounds like bullying, to be honest. It Why is. Do you agree? It is, but it is also uh, in in negotiations. Is is that uh, you need to always 
make your opponent uh, see that uh, whatever it is that they demand from you, you you have to negotiate the maximum out of it. You have to. It's, there's also there's also like imagine imagine right. It's like they've almost led the Americans on, like a guy or a girl leads on a girl or a guy. Right? Yes. So in the sense that we're getting closer, closer, closer to the finishing point, and then it's like actually no. Yes. Yeah. You're gonna give me something else now. <laughs> right like uh, uh right? extortionists <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like because you like the, and this is the thing is that in negotiations as well the human factor can't be overstated right so you're building a friendship with the person as well and as you're building the friendship you're starting to get along and you're you know seeing eye to eye on a v variety of things and just as you're about to get to the finishing line you kick the can down the road and you're like no you're going to give me more and now the other side has already revealed how desperate they are, you see, because the, you can tell. So this is the general atmosphere that's characterizing these uh, negotiations. And once again, I'm not really much of a told you so kind of guy, but this is what it was about. Man. This is why we were say this is why we were in favor of intra Afghan negotiations, because we were saying, look, every day that passes, you are losing leverage at the negotiating table. If you are smart, if you have a realistic, pragmatic view of how politics and organizations work, the best time to negotiate was yesterday yeah. and the day before and 2010 and 2001. But every day that passes, you're losing it. So that's, uh, it's not, in terms of the article itself, it's not too consequential with regard to what's being discussed. But it's in the the devils in the details i think that was actually one of the titles of my earliest articles as well the devil is in the details here you're really seeing uh the extent to which sort of the americans did were subjected to the taliban's upper hand but now we're getting to and one of the things with the doha agreement that was signed uh was the allegations that there were secret annexes which the Americans and the Taliban both vociferously denied. So we're talking about the draft agreement, the Doha agreement here, right? This is not the full text of the agreement, but the two secret annexes were, one would detail the Taliban's commitments to suppressing Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, right? The other would attempt to link a US withdrawal to a reduction in the war's violence. Real recognizing that the Taliban would not end its military campaign, i.e. the Americans finally accepted that the Taliban were not going to agree to a durable ceasefire. Khalidzad proposed that all sides temporarily halt fighting in five of the country's 34 provinces so the U.S. could safely begin its withdrawal. In the rest of Afghanistan, the war would continue and the Taliban attacked American fort units. And what happens in the secret annexes of the agreement is that the Americans, if the Taliban attacked Afghan units, the Americans could intervene right now what does that actually mean let's think about this Sangar, from a military perspective right if the taliban attack Ameri uh, uh, the afghan army the americans would intervene right what the hell does that mean because let's say the taliban are preparing an attack but they haven't actually attacked yet right well general miller as the article states would attack them preemptively according to which the Taliban would object and say, hey, we didn't attack the Afghan army, right? Why are you attacking us? Also, who attacks who, who fires the first shot in war and in politics? You know better than I, because you've got much more experience than I do. You can yes, never I really- Yes, I spent years on the front line. I know all about no, but it. As a, as, a, as, a, as a political analyst, yeah. as a political, there was the same thing in Syria as well. Like I'm not gonna profess to be an expert in the Syrian conflict, but who fired the shot first and where and how, you're never going to be able to determine it. And if you try going, it's a black hole that will suck you in all the way to who fired the first shot in 2001, right? Yeah, so, so, so it's, the, this... It's this, not really possible to determine. You're right, but just for the argument's sake, uh, the signal intelligence, SIGINT, uh, what, uh, as they call it, uh, the Afghan uh, uh, government of uh, Ashraf Ghani, their armed forces, they were trained and pretty well equipped. 
but most of the expensive tools and expensive toys were managed either by the Americans, the American uh, forces in Afghanistan, or military contractors uh, who were also Americans in most cases. Uh, so uh, basically, to, to, uh, uh, without going into too much detail, the uh, armed forces of the regime, they were basically the cannon fodder, okay? And the guys who managed all the uh, uh, intelligence gathering equipment, uh, whether it's uh, signals and antennas, what they, all the spying equipment that they had, everything was in the hands of contractors and the Americans. So they could see in advance what is happening if the Taliban are making a move on a particular uh, military outpost or whatever. So they were capable of uh, then calling on uh, close air support, uh, he uh, helicopters or uh, those uh, small warthog airplanes or whatever. They were, they were able to do that and in intervene so that uh, the Taliban, during the whole process of negotiations that they do not increase their uh, hold over territory in Afghanistan because that would also give him give them more leverage so that that's 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 an that's an explanation for what what is here being said yeah definitely so so that's uh, but unfortunately as it turned out even there were ambiguities about whether the Americans would support the Afghan army, right? Uh, even when they did help, it didn't really deter the Taliban. Like you remember, Sankar, in about summer of, uh, of last year, the Taliban went on a rampage in Helmand, right? And the Americans sort of bombed half-heartedly and whatever. And some districts, they managed to uh, stop the Taliban from overrunning. But the... the they'd still gained a massive amount of ground, right? Uh, I remember the same thing in Kandahar as well. Uh, For years, uh, Afghan forces had relied on US bombers and artillery. For, so yeah, so for years, the Afghan forces had relied on U.S. bombers and artillery to back up the ground attacks and to strike Taliban encampments and supply lines. Now Afghan troops would be on their own during offensive campaigns, and if they were attacked, they would face uncertainties about whether or when U.S. forces would go into action. And this is, for me, this is the last 20 years summed up, right? The moment the, the American air power was gone, the Afghan army were like sitting ducks why? Because the Afghan army itself was built to basically be the supplementary side to the U.S. war machine, just like the Afghan government itself was created to be the supplementary side of the U.S.'s war on terror. This is essentially the whole problem as it is. Uh, if you look at Afghanistan's geography, population, whatever, the current foreign minister in a visit to Islamabad said, we actually don't need an army of 350,000 people. And the usual uh suspects the uh nrf kind of people and uh very nationalistic people from around nangarhar and khost and so on there how dare he say that he's selling our army to pakistan but he's absolutely right what good was the army of three hundred and fifty thousand? uh not just in terms of the drain that is that it is on resources but this army wasn't actually able to fight without air power because and it was assumed it was assumed that the americans would stay here in perpetuity so its effectiveness on the battlefield once the american factor started to disappear even with the american factor things weren't going well even with the american air power and and boots on the ground things weren't going well what would happen when that when the air power went too? And here uh, I would like to uh, explain something that is not in the article, but I think for our audience it is important to understand that uh, war in Afghanistan or in Iraq, uh, the way the war is being waged or uh, the way the war was being waged 
uh, was by uh, military strategists, okay? M U.S. military strategists who are uh, senior uh, military uh, uh, professionals, generals, uh, people like, uh, you know, uh, who, people who have spent years working for the uh, American Armed Forces, those people, they would devise a strategy based on consult, based on advice they receive from private military contractors, from producers of uh, weapons, for, from producers of uh, airplanes, tanks, bombers. They would give these guys a proposal for how to fight the war in Afghanistan. And the, the proposal would be uh, the best way to fight the war in Afghanistan, considering its climate and geography, is to rely heavily on our uh, blah, 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 blah uh, technology. And this is the most effective way of defeating the Taliban. And then those strategists, they would translate that into policy and that would be implemented. But the whole design was to uh, make sure that the U.S. taxpayers' dollars that were being invested in Afghanistan flow into the pockets of the producers of weapons. So the whole strategy was not to actually defeat the Taliban and make sure that the war is finished within a couple of uh, months or years. No, the strategy was to make this a everlasting war so that the government continues pumping money into a military industrial complex. That's the re real reason why their whole structure didn't make any sense. You are going to train the Afghan armed forces to carry around a Kalashnikov or a uh, M4 or M16 on the back of a Ford Ranger pickup truck, and they will have one helicopter and one airplane, the same kind of equipment they use to spray pesticides over, uh, you know, those California uh, uh, orange farms. The whole yes. idea, it was not to create a army and uh, uh, it was not uh, uh, meant to make Afghanistan uh, self-sufficient, self-reliant. That was not the purpose. And, and the Americans, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the people in America, the people who don't really understand their own government, its policy, uh, uh, the way wars are being waged, they're not aware of this. It was all about money. That, that's the real reason why uh, it lasted for 20 years. But why it ended is because people weren't willing to finance this corrupt scheme anymore. That's, the, that's, that's, a, that's something that is not being discussed. And there, there, there it is. Uh, Dr. Hafiz Ahmad is saying, Sangat, please do not propagate conspiracies. On behalf of Sangat, I'd like to apologize to you, uh, but let's move on. So this is a, this is a, um, it's not once again that consequential, but it shows the kind of uh, atmosphere that was underpinning the uh, these negotiations within the White House itself. So with regard to this draft agreement, Trump is so desperate. He's basically saying, uh, Khalilzad is basically telling Trump that that Ghani is not really in favor with this draft deal. And Trump asked, quote, why are you wasting your time going to talk to Ghani? He's a crook, unquote. Khalilzad then asked, sorry, Trump then asked Khalilzad if he could give the Taliban something to make them cooperate. What are you talking about, Mr. President? Like money? No, Khalilzad replied. They're on a terrorist list. We can't give them money. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> you know what's so funny about this quote? You, not not, not yeah. just because it's Donald Trump and he's like, no, well, why don't you give him money? You know, it, that's that's not funny. It's so funny because everybody has read uh, Robert Greene's 33 Strategies of War. 
Okay, and in that book, that one he actually mentions Wazir Akbar Khan. Yes, in in that book, he, 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 the lesson he teaches about the war in Afghanistan, he says that the British uh, they sent McNaughton, and McNaughton tried to buy those tribal leaders and 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 give them money, but they made a huge mistake, and that is you cannot buy these people, they, you cannot buy their loyalty, and now here we are. 150 years later uh, and we're seeing the luckily, same thing playing over and over again luckily for trump he didn't lose his head like mcnaughton did <laughs> but uh that, so 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 this is this interaction is one that i like for a variety of reasons first of all it's hilarious right you can just you can you can hear trump's voice in your head what are you talking about? It's like money. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, it shows that Trump isn't the most aware of how US terrorism lists work and the fact you can't just give people money. And even if they weren't on the terrorism list, like how would the American taxpayer receive that? Like you're giving the Taliban money. It just shows <laughs> it just shows how little Trump cares. <laughs> It, I can only shows, imagine the headlines. I see the headlines. And then the political opposition, the political opposition, Trump is giving the Taliban money to get them to cooperate. Um, fourth, I actually admire the fact that Khalidzad managed to stay composed and not laugh uh, when Trump suggested this. And fifth, contrary to the conspiracy theories that we have in Afghanistan, this shows that Khalidzad was not actually acting as a representative of the Taliban in the White House. So he was, uh, you know, he was very being very realistic here. So at the same time, we move on to the uh, to the next bit, right? Uh, which is the Americans are basically trying to reassure Ghani at the same time um, that they will be on his side. This is a quote by Mike Pompeo to Ashraf Ghani. The United States is your leverage. If we do not get what we want, we will not leave. We will only leave when there is a political solution, political resolution. The clarity that you will stand with us in the negotiation is something that we have never had, Ghani replied. Uh, and that is very is very telling. But then it goes on. Sorry, I didn't bring this quote up in the in the notes that I uh, drafted, Sanger. The, and I'm reading from the article here. Then Pompeo qualified his earlier statement. The only thing that will change that is if we have no progress. Okay. The only thing that will change that is if we have no progress. Rani did not appear to absorb this warning. Later, he quoted Pompeo's comment to a European diplomat, calling it a turning point, evidence that the U.S. truly would not abandon the Islamic Republic until there was a negotiated peace. So Ghani did not actually, um, did not realize that whilst Pompeo was giving him reassurance, he was also giving him a veiled warning that if there is no progress, then... Uh, support would not be forthcoming in the way that Ashraf Ghani wanted. Um, and if we scroll down slightly, Sangar, to Ghani's reservations. So let's see this negotiation from the perspective of Ashraf Ghani, right? And I'm reading from the article here. Um, any chart that he expected? Uh, notionally, Ghani was the sovereign leader of a constitutional democracy. He considered this a matter of high principle and annoyed diplomats by often falling back on legalistic and formalistic expressions of Afghan legitimacy, as a senior State Department official put it. In reality, the state that Ghani led was deeply dependent on American money and military power. They would give us hints about that, what they wanted us to do, but if we did not do those things, then we would get heavy pressure. Moheb, Ghani's national security advisor said, Ghani's suggestions that the Republic would be fine without the US were either shows of bravado or simply wishful thinking. And herein lies the problem, right? And this isn't to engender some sort of sympathy for Ashraf Ghani, but we could say deluded perhaps in the sense that Ghani, it appears, genuinely believed that as a sovereign leader of a country, he could not accept conditions placed on him by the Americans, 
right? This is a matter of principle for him. And we'll see later on as well. Rani is sort of obsessed with how the whole thing looks and its potential ramifications for Afghan sovereignty or rather the sovereignty of his government, depending on which uh, stance you take. Um, and that is that is essentially the crux of the matter. Rani's opposition to this process, the results of this process, were very heavily colored by uh, sort of the ideals that he was grasping onto in terms of uh, Afghan, uh, Afghan sovereignty, independence, and so on and so forth. I remember there's even one video of Ashraf Rani saying that he will not sign another treaty of Gandamak like uh, Mohammed Yaqub Khan. And uh, if you don't know what the Treaty of Gandamak is, it's probably the most infamous treaty uh, signed in the course of Afghan political history ever, uh, in which the British, after invading Afghanistan, essentially summoned the Afghan Amir, who at this point uh, was very ill and had just been released from prison, summoned him to a site in which British troops had previously been killed by Afghan tribesmen and made them sign an agreement handing over the control of Afghan foreign affairs to the British. So Rani was basically invoking that sentiment in opposing the Doha deal. That, isn't that uh, quite then, ironic because he signed the BSA, Bilateral Security Agreement, uh, in 2014, which also gave the Americans a 10-year-long military hegemony over afghanistan it did but uh you know human beings are creatures full of contradictions and uh, various emotions and you know we, i think we should all also try to be careful not to uh, underestimate the human factor to this we are all fallible some of us are more liable to being deluded than others or lacking self-introspection uh, than others so yeah this is a uh, but you know the, uh, the Ashraf Rani was very keen not just uh, abroad but also domestically in articulating his opposition to this peace process in terms of uh, Afghan independence now we're gonna get so once the Doha deal was signed we know that Ashraf Rani was uh very much opposed to the release of the 5,000 prisoners. Uh, there's actually a question, by the way, that I wanted to answer here from Hikmat J, saying, how accurate could Cole's claims be that the 5,000 prisoners was to get the Taliban skeptical of talks to be fully on board? Um, that's a very interesting question. What would you say, Sangat? Uh Oh, let me see how accurate could cause claim uh, that uh, 5,000 prisoners was to get Talib skeptical of the talks fully on board. I think that uh, I think that initially they uh, they said that basically like you know you know uh, i'm a nice guy i'm i'm willing to deal with you but my cousin you know he's 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 crazy you know uh, so uh, I, <laughs> I would be careful because my cousin you know he's uh, uh, i cannot vouch for my cousin's action you know that's that kind of attitude like it reminds me of uh, when i was uh, 15 years old there was this uh, we used to go to the school where basically there were like five or six uh, black and brown students and the rest were all white and there was this one guy he was 16 years old and he was black and he was two meters tall and everyone was scared of him but he was the, the most kindest and most sweet, sweetest guy ever so one of my friends he would extort the whole school other white kids and he would tell them give me your lunch money you give me your uh, money otherwise that tall big guy he will go come and beat you up and that tall big guy wasn't even aware of anything <laughs> he, he didn't even know what was going on behind his back so i'm assuming <laughs> i'm assuming that stanak they basically told khalid zat you know those haqqani guys that you guys <laughs> have been talking about for the last decade <laughs> those really crazy ones yeah they're, they're not gonna accept it it's, they need we need five thousand prisoners yeah. at least and that is a. Uh, I mean, if you think of it, if you think of it objectively, right, it's pretty, it's pretty intelligent because you're basically 
using your own nemesis, uh, their own prejudices and sort of preconceived sort of notions, you're using that against them. So whilst, you know, this factionalization of the Taliban has been something the Americans and the international media have been so uh, interested in, right, and the fact that the Haqqanis are closer to Al-Qaeda and thus more extreme and more dangerous, right, Sheikh Mohammed Abbas, in my opinion, is basically saying, you know those guys, uh, I don't need to introduce them to you. They're really scary, really terrifying. Yes, and, and, and this is also what uh, we published uh, the, 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 the podcast of the military uh, contractor, the advisor for the Afghan uh, uh, intelligence services, uh, Keith Lemke. In his podcast, he also said that if you keep telling the same old lies, you will start believing them. So they actually believe that there are these moderates and there are these extremists and we're discussing peace talks with the moderates, but the extremists, you know. And there's there's also um, there's also the oh, damn, I forgot what I was going to say. But it, yeah, so previously, if Stan Xay had said this, let's say in 2010, right it could be fatal for the movement because then it would be ah so they are divided let's go and basically whack them and basically exploit their divisions but right now stanik zay is reading the room as they say he's reading that the americans are too tired too fatigued from this war so now he can afford to play up this uh, factional split whether or not it's true to basically get extract as many concessions uh, as he can so what so if we go down slide that's basically uh hikmat j that's your question answered um if we go back down to the intra-afghan negotiation section yes sure so what we've got here is uh essentially the account given by and this is important throughout this article is extremely well written but Steve Cole has not actually consulted uh, people on the Imarati side, right? It's American diplomats, Hamdullah Mohib, uh, so on and so forth. But you're not hearing from people like Sher Muhammad Abbas Tanikzai. You're not hearing from people like uh, Anas Haqqani and Mullah Khair Khwa and so on and so forth. So this is the main critique that I have of this article. It's not a criticism, it's a critique. Right. There's a bit of a difference here. What is missing in this article is the contribution of what the Taliban side saw, because from our sources, Sangar, right, we knew during the course of these intra-Afghan negotiations uh, that members of the government team would apparently call Ashraf Ghani at the end of the day and basically give him an update as to what was going on. Uh, and he would apparently instruct them to on how to sabotage things. Now, that is what one side's sources were saying. We're not saying that's the reality, but that is what we were hearing. We were hearing that, I think there was even an article written that Masum Stanagze, who is a Stanagze, but on the government side, uh, yes, it's not all tribal and ethnic, believe it or not. But yeah, uh, Masum Stanagze went to Ashraf Ghani in Kabul, visited him and was insulted and Ashraf Ghani held profanity at him uh, because he wasn't heeding his instructions. We also heard that members of the negotiating team during negotiations would literally swear at the Taliban, right? And now someone obviously watching this will be like, yes, the Taliban are very bad people. I hope he called them Gausala and I hope he did this and I hope he did that. And that may be well and good. That may be your stance, but in a political negotiation insulting people hurling profanity at them is not the way to do it and we also knew that that person would essentially spend most of his time in doha in uh, in alcoholic bars now that person is actually mentioned in this article i'm not going to mention their name but he you know this is this is kind of what we were hearing so it's interesting at the same time and enriching to hear the other side's perspective on the Doha talks, which Steve Cole has articulated. But what is missing from the article is the fact that one side's uh, input is totally missing. So uh, that's something I just needed to put out there. So on September the 12th, at Sharp Resort, so this was after 
um, this was after um, the 5,000 prisoners were released on the Taliban side and 1,000 on the government side. Intra-Afghan negotiations are formally inaugurated, right? The group of 21 delegates sent by Kabul have been preparing for months, like athletes training for a big season, perpetually delayed, and a German foundation had delivered seminars on how to negotiate for peace. Well, if it's true that one of the negotiators was swearing at the Taliban, maybe that German foundation needs to have a re-evaluation as to what was going on. <laughs> but at the Sharq, the Kabul team found that the Taliban were exceedingly stubborn. It took more than two months to resolve one agenda item. The Taliban were feeling a kind of pride that they defeated the United States. Hasiba Sarabi, one of the delegates, recalled. There's another thing, Sanget, right? In negotiations, not everything is meant to make it out to the media. Do you remember when the Taliban basically, uh, in terms of formulating the code of conduct for these agreements, they said that we want to use Hanafi fiqh as our basis, and it made it across to international media who started saying that the non-Hanafis of Afghanistan were on the verge of a genocide. Now, <laughs> in a negotiation, in a negotiation, that sort of thing is not supposed to get out, right? So it's not supposed to get out and uh, Fawziya Kufi should not be, um, you know, giving, writing op-eds about it and giving interviews and being celebrities if you are really genuine about peace. Now, of course, of course, this is not saying that the Taliban were not stubborn or did not feel like they needed to negotiate. It's The two can be equally true. They don't cancel each other out. Now, if we scroll down, Sanger. Uh, just one thing, um, the whole idea that, uh, the, that the Taliban were very stubborn and very reluctant in coming to terms with the other side, it's actually a continuation of what we previously saw of how the Taliban were negotiating with the Americans because they felt like, okay, we have the upper hand. We have the upper hand in the negotiations uh, because we have already gained what we want from the Americans. So now all we have to do is take something from you. And 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 they weren't wrong. Yes. I mean, look at where we are. They weren't wrong. They were in that position. Uh, now, someone is obviously going to say, but Ahmed Walid, should they not have done it for the sake of reconciliation? and peace and so on and so forth absolutely but political actors don't really necessarily or usually act in the way that you and i would want them to or in the interests of uh, the countries or the people that they claim to represent which once again comes back to why we were telling or we were such big proponents of the intra-afghan negotiations because sangat and i in our infinite wisdom uh, of something about 67 years cumulative life shared between us could read the room we knew what was going on so that is a uh, but you know once again if you want evidence of sangar and i's infinite wisdom and the true fountains of knowledge that we are uh you you're more than free to go back to our podcasts from the period which are still on our youtube channel we stand vindicated as fountains of knowledge in any case, <laughs> so um, at the same time, the guerrillas mounted offensives in Kandar and Helmand that were clearly violations in spirit, if not the written word of the Doha agreement during the last three months of 2020. Now, after the prisoner release, violence spiked across Afghanistan and civilian casualties rose by 45%. This is relevant because the 5,000 prisoners that were released include amongst, included amongst others the guy who is currently the governor of Helmand, who was released from prison, Maulawi Talib, and who basically conquered Lashkargah. So he was released from prison and went straight back to the battlefront, uh, which you could say potentially is a violation of the spirit of the Doha agreement, right? Um, and... If we scroll down slightly, Sanger. Ah, the, this bit I found interesting, by, by the way. The Taliban protested many American strikes carried out in supporting support of the Afghan forces, like aggressive corporate litigators seeking to drown their opponents in paper. The guerrillas filed more than 1,600 complaints to Khalil Zad's team and used them to justify their intensifying military campaign against Kabul. Okay? 
Um, I didn't know that. Well, apparently the Taliban were very busy. Uh, 1,600 complaints. Damn. No wonder they were so hard to get a hold of when we wanted to write articles. They were busy bombarding Khalilzad, not with bombs, <laughs> but with letters. <laughs> okay. In, a, in any case, uh, the talks between Taliban envoys and Kabul's team offered little evidence that any diplomatic breakthrough was possible. Ghani's delegates lived at the resort and had few ties to Qatar. Uh, the Taliban envoys, who had homes in Doha, as well as families and businesses, generally turned up at the resort every two or three days, and then only at night, Sarabi, the delegate from Kabul, recalled. Time management was not good. In early January, the Taliban delegation did not even appear for talks as scheduled. Uh, and if we scroll down, I'm going to wrap this section up slightly. Yes. So Sarabi is saying that Khalilzad took the side. So this is uh, this is an interesting one, right? Because it actually um, it shows the dichotomy and how uh, the two sides or the three sides were perceiving each other. So many of Kabul's delegates lost any remaining faith that they had in Khalilzad. Sarabi accused them of taking the side of the Taliban. She said it was very clear that Khalilzad wanted the Taliban to be the head of the government as part of transnational power sharing agreement and that he wanted Ghani to leave the off leave office. Khalilzad did believe that Ghani would have to give up power for a transitional government to be formed, but he said that he never, ever supported putting a Taliban leader in charge. To some extent, he blamed the impasse on Ghani's intransigence. Later, Khalilzad said that his biggest mistake was failing to put even more pressure on Ghani to compromise. So, you know, the amount of misunderstanding here between the American side and the Afghan side, is it any real surprise that Kabul fell before the Americans had even left? Um, and this is a, actually an interesting bit. It's not, once again, that consequential. Um, but this uh, goes to the fact, the extent to which the Americans were backtracking from supporting the Taliban. Sorry, supporting the. <laughs> Tal Sorry, I sounded like the Americans were supporting there. the Taliban. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very, very NRF of me. But in any case, uh, this past May, Yasin Ziyar, the chief of army staff and acting minister of defense, learned that Central Command, the U.S. headquarters in charge of the Afghan war, would attempt to provide aircraft tele-maintenance by video on iPads employing specialists in Qatar. They said the mechanic from our side would sit in front of the Zoom and the person from Qatar would advise him to do this or that, Ziyar recalled. Damn. <laughs> Talk about, uh, you know, uh, not turning up to the fight. But once again, this shows, as we correctly deduced at the time, as well, as uh, Stan Akzai deduced from the Americans that they were desperate to leave. Yunus Ejazi is saying very Avran Kaka of you to say that the Americans were supporting the Taliban. Yes, deep down within us, <laughs> an Afghan <laughs> uncle resides. Um, so, and then Bacim, after... Bacim, you call us yak taute amrikoyos ho. Yak dasisa amrikoyos. Yak dasisas, you call us yak bozis. Uh, man, I, I don't know why I'm feeling like a bit of a comedian, <laughs> a bit of a comedian today. Maybe you're just I tired. Feel... You're just tired, just no, like me. No, you know what? I actually think it's because I put two teaspoons of coffee in my coffee ah. uh, as opposed to one. So maybe that uh, accounts for why I'm being a bit of a Mr. Bean here. But so this is. Uh, the July visit happened, and the July visit, if you remember, Sangar, was um, basically uh, Vlad Vlad is saying Sangar speaks Pashto with a Persian accent. Spoiler, Vlad Vlad, Sangar was speaking Persian, not Pashto. Uh, but in any case, um, the July visit happened, Sangar, and uh, it's interesting because uh, let me just pull up some of the quotes. So, uh, Biden, sorry, it's not July, it was in June. It was just at the end of June. So Biden welcomed Rani and his top aides to the Oval Office on the afternoon of June the 25th. We're not walking away, Biden told Rani. He pulled from his shirt pocket a schedule card on which he'd written the number of American lives lost in Afghanistan and Iraq since 2001 and showed it to Rani. 
I appreciate the American sacrifices, Lenny said. Then he explained, our goal for the next six months is to stabilize the situation and describe the circumstance in Afghanistan as a Lincoln moment. The most important ask I have for Afghanistan is that we have a friend in the White House, Rani said. You have a friend, Biden replied. Rani asked for specific military assistance. Could the U.S. provide more helicopters? Would American contractors continue to offer logistical support to the Afghan military? Biden's answers were vague, according to the Afghan officials in the room. Um, and Biden later on said that the likelihood of the Taliban doing anything rational is not very high. So this is interesting. Rani has gone to the Americans in the White House. He's in the Oval Office. He's telling them, we need your help. We need your support. Biden is reassuring him that you have a friend in me, so on and so forth. When it gets to specifics, however, Biden starts to backtrack, not because he has faith in the Taliban, but he's saying that the Taliban won't act rationally. So what can we deduce from this? Biden doesn't really care if the Taliban take over Afghanistan, right? Because he is predicting he, he that already they won't said act that rationally. he already yeah. said that. Exactly. So it wasn't just showmanship in that sense as well. Um, and that is, uh, you know, little surprise it is then that, uh, you know, with all of the lack of, um, with the lack of support given, and the lack of, to be fair, caring that Biden had with regard to Afghanistan, that Kabul fell in the, in the way that it did. And I found these to be interesting as well, not just because of the dates and the momentous events that happened, but also because there's a really good encapsulation of the essence of politics in Afghanistan for the last 20 years. On August the 6th, the Taliban captured Zaranj in Nimroz province in the south or the southwest, the first provincial capital to fall. The next day, the U.S. embassy urged all American citizens to leave Afghanistan. Rani's office continued to post progress reports on social media about Afghanistan's modernizing drive. On August the 10th, Rani's official Facebook page announced new infrastructure projects, including one in the northern city of Kunduz, where the Taliban now, where the Taliban flag now flew. Um, you know, I remember when Zaranj fell. I remember there was a journalist at uh, Radio Azadi, Farood Bejan, uh, who was basically like, don't worry, Zaranj is a small town. And I you responded know, to him, you know, and he uh, blocked me. Yeah, you know that Furud Bejan uh, spent very little time in Afghanistan while uh, writing about Afghanistan. Like, we get the criticism for not being on the ground and having a podcast and talking about Afghanistan. Uh, we don't have the uh, U.S. Congress-funded uh, Radio Free Europe behind us. Uh, we have to work we have jobs, uh, we have to pay rent, uh, and that's why we cannot just go and uh, spend time in Afghanistan and report on the ground. We do what we can. But this guy, he works for Radio Free Europe, which is funded by U.S. Congress. Uh, they have billions of dollars of budget, but all he does is sit in Prague and in where not in Europe and in America, and he writes his articles doing interviews via chat and uh, voice um, calling etc he doesn't know anything so obviously he will block you when you say oh zaranj is significant i i bet he couldn't even i bet he couldn't even find zaranj on the map you know what is interesting what is uh what what's the best you know there's a journalist called murtaza hussein and he's like the highest form of respect is when people block you without you ever interacting with them. It's like the people fleeing Genghis Khan before his hordes arrived. Uh, so yeah, I've got a couple of- I don't know if I fair. want to be uh, even uh, associated with Genghis Khan. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, so this is the thing, this is the problem. There was so much emphasis on social media uh, in this, in the last 20 years where you know, there's um, there's uh, cities falling, and instead, Ashraf and his team are busy on social media. So that's uh, I, I just felt that that was. Uh, if you read Matthew Aiken's article, by the way, and perhaps we'll review that as well, maybe next week, 
right? Or maybe um, we'll you, have Matthew on our show. Maybe we'll have Matthew on our show. But it also says, uh, on the basis, I presume, of conversation with Hamdallah Mahiv, that tens of thousands of fake accounts are made on Twitter and Facebook to call people names. Um, and, uh, you know, that's uh, that's something that both of us have experience of. Yeah, so, uh, I, I, do, I do have to mention one thing in particular, that in the last, like, seven years or so, that Facebook has become really popular among Afghans. You had these entire armies of people who would hurl all sorts of profanity at you if you would criticize Ashraf Ghani or Amrullah Saleh or any of these people. And it was quite obvious that these guys are doing this 24-7. They, 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 have, they have a career doing that. That's one aspect of it. And the second aspect is that shortly after the fall of the Republic, suddenly it went quiet. Yeah, man. It yeah, went that quiet. Was very quiet. Yeah, that was a very quiet period on Twitter, and and on uh, and on uh, Facebook as well. I'm not so. Uh, I, I'm actually and uh, I'm not active on Facebook at all because of all the uh, you know restrictions and everything. You can't say anything there. You can't even post a news story. But uh, what I did notice is that uh, now those troll armies uh, are gone. The Ghani armies. But now we have uh, a NRF troll army, uh, the MDD uh, movement, as I call them. But but yes, Mister Dardarum, Mister Dardarum, that's like talking with Naswar in your mouth, Mister Dardarum. You know, my favorite wasn't even the dad that of all Taliban. Kuja dar Islam. Ne, Kuja dar Islam. Me. The Qajada Islami music nest. But yeah, in any case, reading the bit about the social media made me feel like Bisyar <laughs> Dad in, in any case, uh, man, maybe maybe I should have uh, two teaspoons of coffee more often. You should, but, you should. <laughs> so this is a so once again, this isn't like a proper in-depth conversation on this article because it could go on for 10 hours. So now we're getting to the bit of um, the run-up to Kabul's fall or liberation inclusivity points. On Saturday, the August the 14th, amid reports that Taliban units uh, could you Where scroll are you up reading? Uh, ah, what is that ah, yeah, yeah. On Saturday, August the 14th, Yes. So on Saturday, August the 14th, this was around the time, Sangad, where you and I had no life. It was just work, live stream, maybe a gym session if we could catch it. Uh, but it was just working and live streaming, right? So um, amid reports that Taliban units were already inside Kabul, Ghani dropped his demands, right? Now he simply f hoped for an orderly transfer of power endorsed by a lawyer, Jirga. He told Blinken that he was ready to accept whatever his envoys and the Biden administration agreed on with the Taliban. Blinken asked him to get the delegation to Doha as quickly as possible to show the Taliban that this is a serious process. We need a ceasefire to process this. Please lean as much as you can on a dignified process, Ghani said. He remained adamant that any transfer of power should be all endorsed by the Afghan assembly. Please convey to the Taliban that this is not a surrender. Dignified is exactly what he we exactly what we want as well. Reni told him that if the Taliban rejected this last effort to bring about an orderly transition or did not negotiate in good faith, I will fight to the death. So August the 14th was roughly when Herat had fallen, when Kandahar had fallen. I believe it was also the day on which I was on the BBC saying there needs to be an orderly transition of power right uh, it was on bbc radio by the way i was like one party cannot monopolize all of the the whole government right so unfortunately that didn't happen my words and the fountain of knowledge i am the words that i spoke <laughs> were not heeded you know and it's it's comical that uh that so many people actually fell for that 
rhetoric of we will fight to death and we will do this and we will do that and 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 it it it's funny but at the same time it's it's somewhere deep down it really makes your blood boil to know that uh, how many people have gone straight to their death defending this guy fighting uh, for for his uh, government and then for what yeah there's it's, so there's yeah. a guy in the chat saying imran Allah khan is saying are these two taliban cheerleaders no we're not and i don't know if he just joined the stream but if you want to go august the 14th i was on the bbc basically saying that there needs to be an orderly transition of power to prevent one party from um, monopolizing power now so we have the receipts <laughs> uh, our records are very clear we were always pro intra-afghan negotiations a negotiated settlement one party we always said cannot represent all of afghanistan uh, and fighting and killing needs to stop now fighting and killing has stopped but because certain actions were not taken one party now does dominate all of afghanistan so that is to answer the question imran Allah khan you're free to go down our youtube channel and uh, make your own conclusions but this is um we're coming to Ghani's escape and this is the bit that really makes my blood boil okay it was in late july that Ghani and mohib first discussed the possibility that they would be forced to flee one of Ghani's priorities was to remove his book collection from harm's way fair enough respect that his preference was to retreat from the capital to eastern afghanistan where he had political and military allies okay now that obviously is not surprising the book collection fair enough the game is the game i have my book collection as well i would not want to have it harmed but these guys were plotting to flee or were making contingency plans and this is what we were saying at the time as well that the government's own personnel did not have skin in the game they would leave the moment things got bad and yet they were still banging the drums of war um but this is uh we're contextualizing the uh, events of August the 15th. So Khalilzad hoped to arrange a two-week ceasefire and an orderly transfer of power in Kabul to be sacrificed by a law, sorry, to be sanctified. My, I don't have my glasses, guys, sorry. To be sanctified by a mini lawyer jirga. So at this point, August the 14th, the Taliban are at the gates of Kabul, right? Some of their units have actually breached the parameters of Kabul city. Uh, but generally speaking, they've managed to stay at the gates of Kabul. And Mullah Bradar has also spoken to Khalid Zad and said, look, we're not entering the city. We want an orderly transition of power. Sangar Kalajnu Kikshat al Larsa. Imran Allah Khan is saying, you people are enjoying the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban, apparently. Compare the Afghanistan of December 2020 with the Afghanistan of today. Now, don't tell me to go eat grass. Um, I mean, well, the comparison is we have less people dying, but a humanitarian crisis that has been months and years in the bill. Imran Lajana, I really don't know what you're trying to tell me. But like I said, our receipts are there and our consciences are clear. Um, now, uh, so the 15th of August, at roughly one o'clock, Mohib received a text message that Khalil Haqqani a leader of the Taliban faction named for his family, wished to speak with him. He took a call from a Pakistani number. Haqqani's message, recall, Haqqani's message, Mahib recalled, was essentially surrender. He said that they could meet after Mahib had uh, issued an appropriate statement. When Mahib proposed that they negotiate first, Haqqani repeated himself and hung up. Mahib called Tom West, a deputy to Khalilzad in Doha, to inform him of the call. West told him not to go to any meeting because it might be a trap. Mahib returned to Ghani's residence at around 2. He escorted Rola, who is the first lady, President Ashtaf Ghani's wife, uh, in a motorcade to a helipad behind Dil Koshar Palace. Um, uh, they were to fly to Hamid Karzai International Airport to make the Emirates flight. Three of the president's MI-17s were now at the Arg 
The fourth was at the airport. He learned that the pilots had fully fueled the helicopters because they wanted to fly directly to Tajikistan or Uzbekistan as soon as possible, as other Afghan military pilots seeking refuge had done in recent days. The pilots did not want to hop over to the airport with Rula because they'd received reports that rogue Afghan soldiers were seizing or grounding helicopters there. Korche, the head of the presidential guard, approached Muhib. If you leave, you will be endangering the president's life, he said. And do you want me to stay? Mohib asked. No, I want you to take the president with you. Mohib doubted that all of Ghani's bodyguards would remain loyal if the Taliban entered the palace grounds. And Korche indicated he did not have the means to protect the president. Mohib helped Rola onto the president's helicopter and asked her to wait. With Korche, he drove back to the residence. He found Rani standing inside and took his hand. Mr. President, it's time, Mohib said. We must go. Rani wanted to go upstairs to collect some belongings, but Mohib worried. Bags of cash. Every, but Mohib worried that every mo minute they delayed, they risked touching off a panic and a revolt by armed guards. Mohib, Rani climbed into a car without so much as his passport. So there is this uh, there's this video clip, okay, of the moment where you see Rani and uh, Moheb uh, all walking towards the helicopter, and one of the guards in the palace is recording that, and while he's recording it, he's saying, "Ena, Ena, Bibi, gorecht, Ena, Rani me kate Moheb gorecht." So he's saying, "Look, look, there you see Rani and Moheb, they're they're running away, they're escaping." That clip. It was uh, uh, on social media somewhere in September, no, not even in August. So the guy, the guard, who, whoever he was, the one who, who, who made that recording on his phone, he didn't just upload it to Facebook or Twitter immediately. Yeah, but um, that's basically it. And what's, there are a couple of things that annoy me about this, right? Um, so the thing with this article is, is that, so I'm someone, Sangar, that, have, that has been called a sympathizer for, my, for many, many years, uh, just because I like to see things from different people's perspectives, right? Yeah. Um, now, Steve Cole has given a really brilliant uh, sort of breakdown as to what was going on in Ashraf Ghani's head during this time right um and i don't call him a ashraf Rani sympathizer for that right um just give me a second here I'm gonna... you can also you can also accuse steve cole of being a taliban sympathizer by exactly. revealing all of this stuff like exposing what was going on and how exactly. it was a big farce and and so I, this is the I thing i think you this know is... uh, just uh, just one thing that I wanted to say, uh, last point about this article. Uh, it is very important to have this story told by Steve Cole. Okay? Uh, we know we have this whole counter narrative uh, seeing through an Afghan eye and uh, telling the story from an Afghan perspective. Uh, but the thing is, is that as Afghans, we are also very divided mm -hmm. and we are very divided and we all, uh, never see eye to eye. But uh, here at the Afghan eye, we are trying to do uh, uh, justice to having different perspectives, which is not always easy. But sometimes it is necessary to have a white guy uh, as a sort of uh how do you say especially if he has sources in the state department yes like here hear it from another perspective you hear you heard it from us but here is uh someone like steve cole and he is revealing what we have been saying all along so there's there's so once again like some not very intelligent person is going to come along and be like steve cole is taliban sympathizer right um and others could but he's actually did, done a very good job of illustrating what was going on in sort of Ashraf Rani's mind right so 
for example, I'm going to read a passage from the article here, right? To illustrate my point. Khalilzad was in WhatsApp contact with Abdul Salam Rahimi, an aide to Ghani, and informed Rahimi of this plan. Uh, the mini lawyer Jirka. Rahimi told Ghani that the Taliban had pledged not to enter Kabul. Yet this was based on assurances from Khalilzad and the Taliban, and Ghani re regarded both as unreliable sources. Right? So that's a, that's a really, it's good because it demonstrates what was going on in Ashraf Ghani's mind, which propelled him to basically flee. Right now, you and I seem to agree that him fleeing was not the best decision because you know even this um all of this uncertainty the humanitarian crisis all of this it stems from the lack of an orderly transition of power right if that was done as that was conducted perhaps we wouldn't be at this stage where we are right now right so you and i agree on that but at the same time it's very useful to know what exactly was going on in ashtav Ghani's mind right that prompted him to flee what and that so this isn't a criticism it's constructive criticism what would enrich this article further is speaking to the taliban leaders what were they thinking right so when they initially when biden announced that he would be extending the withdrawal by a couple of months you remember sangar hundreds of districts fell to the taliban most of them without a fight I wrote an article saying Biden's paved the wall, the way for civil war in Afghanistan. Now, I put my hands up. I was wrong because I I underestimated the Taliban, right? I didn't think that they would capture Afghanistan so quickly. But, you know, if we spoke to the Taliban, what were you thinking at that point? What were your motives? I mean, yeah, sure, we could say you and I have deduced that seizing the political and military initiative is something that benefits and suits them, Right. But if we could actually look at the world through their eyes at that point, that would enrich this article further, you see? But at the same time, this, the title of the article is The Secret History of the US's <clears throat> Diplomatic Failure. So I'm not going to sit here and say, because this article has done a very, it's, a, it's done an exceptional job illustrating Ashraf Ghani's rationale or illustrating uh, Khalid Zadra rationale that it's bad. I think it's wonderful. However, I think that this needs to only be the beginning of subsequent articles that are written. Who knows? Maybe we'll write it together, Sangat. We'll speak to some of the people who are involved from a different perspective, and maybe they'll be and able to share with that's, us. That's the thing. That's the thing. So, so from the uh, mid-90s until now, uh, we have very little books, uh, articles, uh, giving people a very good insight of the Taliban movement, uh, their own internal debates and arguments, uh, what they're struggling with, with their own uh, ideas. And uh, like, for instance, we know that uh, prior to the uh, announcement of this uh, interim government, uh, there were rumors that so-and-so will get this ministry and so-and-so will get that ministry. And it was like we knew basically they will create a same cabinet as they had 20 years ago. Uh, but why? Wh what was the justification for that? And uh, I think it's it's interesting for people to understand how this current regime came about. Uh, all these details need to be investigated. Uh, uh, there are different uh, key uh, figures within the movement need to be interviewed, uh, which will be eventually a major part of the Afghanistan history, modern Afghanistan history, what has transpired in the last couple of decades. Uh, and it's it's a, it's a it's a huge task for our Afghan journalists, our community. Uh, we have our own people who are capable of doing that, but that's absolutely necessary. I I believe you know this that this is something that needs to be documented in books, articles, documentaries. Uh, very, uh, yeah.
a huge, huge task to, for the Afghan journalists. Because I don't Definitely. think I don't think Western journalists will have that kind of access and candor from the these figures in their interviews and conversations. Inshallah, you know, maybe we will be able to contribute even on a minute scale uh, to that development of the scholarship. Women Allahi Tawfiq. Um uh revolution is saying Lol, blame it on Ghani that now Taliban cannot handle cannot but he's basically saying you're blaming it on Ghani uh, that the Taliban can't hand, can't run the country people dying of hunger uh, well I wouldn't blame Ghani for that but I mean this is something that the Taliban have inherited the fact that people are running from the country is something that was Happening in 2014, when the Americans withdrew the bulk of their troops, um, there was an economic recession, people drowned in the Mediterranean. So it's something that Taliban have inherited. Have they done everything right? No, they haven't. Am I blaming Rani for it? Um, I'm blaming Rani for the continuation of a war when he should have been more aware that his position was weak. And now someone's going to say, well, the Taliban did defensives. Yeah, I know. But if you're losing, you just have to throw in the towel. Because, I mean, ultimately, right, Rani did not throw in the towel. And how did that go? Yeah. Right? That's all. How did it go? So, uh, <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, we're uh, past the two-hour marker, but uh, we started actually talking... Uh, quite late so we we have another 15 minutes so for those of you who have any explanation uh, uh sorry any questions nasir durani is asking are you two ready to go and help your people in any way you possibly can if yes what what's your plan um if you go back to a previous live stream of ours we spoke about our project at the afghan eye to go to afghanistan record a documentary uh amongst other things in which um in which we aim to cover the prevailing circumstances in Afghanistan. So we have that scheduled for next year. In terms of helping the people, I assume you mean it in a charitable sense, uh, that isn't really our area of expertise, whilst I'm sure all of us contribute on a private, in a private capacity in the way we can. We're not really going there specifically for charitable purposes, but both of us do use our platforms to promote those uh, within Afghanistan who are involved in the distribution of funds, uh, aid, and so on and so forth. So if you go on Twitter, uh, Nasir Durrani, you'll find uh, a lot of uh, information there, uh, which other people can give you sort of a better picture of than I can. Younes Ejazi said that Wahid Rahimdil explained this quite well. Wahid Rahimdil is quite an interesting guy. He has a black belt in karate, uh, he is an intellectual philosopher. Uh, he studied in UK, I believe, and he knew Gang. and he knew Ehsan Shafiq. If you Ehsan Shafiq talk there, you you know that uh, famous Afghan karate uh, kung, kung fu uh, expert who lived in UK. He died from a heart attack. He has these videos of him doing those amazing kicks. Uh, okay. On YouTube, every video has like 20 million views. Uh, he, he's a legend, like very famous guy. And uh, uh, Wahid Rahimdel, uh, who has a black belt, he uh, knew him. I think uh, Ehsan Shafiq was his uh, coach. I see. Well, there we go. But uh, I think we should wrap it Vla up. Uh, wait, Vlad Vlad has an, a, a question. Will their Afghans start exploiting their natural resources like minerals, coals, and hydrocarbons? Well, uh, we have heard that the current government is co in negotiating with uh, many uh, entities from different parts of the world uh, and trying to uh, make uh, deals and uh, have them invest in Afghanistan so that uh, they can finally uh, exploit those natural resources uh, however uh, due to sanctions and all the uh, 
problems that are still existing. It is not something that is going to start right away, but uh, they are talking and there are some developments. Mm. Any more questions? But uh, yeah, guys, um, apologies that this podcast or live stream rather was not as organized as I'd have liked it to be. Uh, but <laughs> we we quite literally had about an hour to prepare. Yeah. So, uh, Sangar, good question. What is the situation with General Mubin Khan? Uh, as far as I know, uh, General Mubin Khan, who is the spokesperson for the police in Kabul, and he's also quite a social media character. Uh, a social media sensation. Yes, like a chick magnet, uh, <laughs> whatever you like to call it. But he basically uh, was, uh, it, it is claimed that he was uh, detained and investigated. And he denied that. And he said, I wasn't detained and I wasn't investigated. And uh, there are rumors people made these fake uh, documents suggesting that he is being uh, uh, persecuted for uh, allegedly doing this or that. But to be honest, I think, you know, the reason why he is in the news and people are speculating about him is because he is a social media figure. That's the reason. Uh, people uh, come up with all sorts of uh, stories uh, about him because it's quite weird to have a Talib being a social media influencer. It's just weird. And I think that's the reason why so many people An are Enigma talking about him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Yunus Hijazi is saying he's with Khalid Zadran right now. Check the recent tweets. Oh, I mean, I got the sense that they were having a bit of a nah, tension that's... but I'll, you know for, for the two of them i guess it's good news that they're, they're going to reconcile vlad vlad is asking is the afghan youth more secular than their forefathers more open-minded as the leftists say i don't necessarily think so i think it's the the, the size of these demographics have remained roughly uh, consistent um yeah I think uh, I think that uh, the saying that the Afghan youth are more secular or more religious, that doesn't make any sense because Afghan youth, we're talking about a country with over 40 million uh, inhabitants and there are all sorts of Afghan youth. There are secular Afghan youth, religious, all kinds. So... All right. Okay. Oh, uh, Bek was saying. Uh, Samada. Uh, anyways, guys, thank you very much for joining us for this rather abruptly announced Afghan Eye live stream. So we dissected at a surface level the article written by Steve Cole and Adam Entaus, I believe. Uh, Wal is asking, will you follow this time slot in future? This time suits me in Australia. Potentially, maybe not. Uh, we were actually supposed to come on a lot earlier, but due to other commitments we came on uh, a bit later fn hussein is reminding me to ask for likes on the video that goes without saying uh guys if you if this is your first time on our channel please uh like the video share it and subscribe to our youtube channel even if you are imran Allah khan and you were thoroughly angered by some of the stuff we said at the end of the day we are brothers in humanity faith i hope and Afghans. So please like the uh, video, subscribe, and perhaps someday you'll find it within yourself to not see us as evil as you may see us right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in any case, yeah, guys, uh, share the video on social media so others can find it the way you have. Uh, Nasir Durrani's actually sent a super chat of $9.99. Thank you very much, Nasir Durrani. I, I don't know uh, if I should thank you in Pashto. But yeah, please, uh, thank you very much. And uh, both of us are humbled. And we hope that in future, our content can be rewarding for you. And you can see the fruits of this $9.99 in our future content. So, and guys, um, whilst we're at sharing the video, don't just share it blandly. 
you know, uh, maybe I'm asking for a bit too much. I'm being like Sher Muhammad Abbas. Say Hamid stuff Zahir. like these guys are yeah. amazing, incredible. Yeah, well, wow. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out a uh, Sher Muhammad Abbas stand <laughs> on you. We're at the finish line, and now I'm gonna kick the can further down the road. Should be like, wow, this live stream is amazing. You know, <laughs> incredible. These guys really are fountains of knowledge, right? Uh, <laughs> So yeah, uh, share the video, subscribe to the channel if it's your first time, like the video, and yeah, to everyone that is in the chat, your local Akhi is saying the Afghan eye is really underrated, Yunus Ejazi is agreeing, Maryam Mahadzada saying thank you, uh, Anush Iran is saying, Manana Aurora wa salam, wa salam wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.